thank you, Henry, for your very kind and, and generous introduction. In my talk today, I'd like to uh, share with you a topic which has fascinated me uh, and has been with me for on and off for about 20 years now, um, actually a little bit more than 20 years. And it all started when I was an undergraduate at Keio University. Having spent uh, three years uh, in high school in New York, as, as uh, Professor Smith mentioned, I had chosen English as my major in college with the idea that an English major would be easy for me and would leave me enough time to pursue other interests. Uh, because I had uh, this, this hopeless inability to make up my mind uh, about what to concentrate on. Initially, I had even thought about majoring in the sciences, and I had been accepted uh, in the biology department of all places at Stuba University. So it was a bit of a uh, struggle for me to decide what to major in, and finally I decided on an English major, thinking it would be easy. What I didn't count on was that the English major at Keio University uh, involved a number of excruciatingly boring courses, uh, Old English, Middle English, Pedagogy in English, English Phonetics, uh, it was all a little bit of a nightmare. But in fact, I was uh, able to take a number of electives, uh, sometimes as much as 17 courses a semester. So in all, it was a good experience. Perhaps most importantly, the English major uh, at Keio University at the time uh, allowed students the option of writing a thesis, a senior thesis in English. And I was lucky to have found a professor, Professor Takamiya, Toshiyuki, who was willing to let the students choose any topic they wished, as long as it was explored and uh, written up in a scholarly manner. And so I ended up with a topic which uh, combined a lot of my very scattered and diverse interests. Among them was opera. In New York, my parents had dragged us children to the Metropolitan Opera and had become fascinated by opera. Uh, also Japanese theater. I didn't know very much about Japanese theater, but uh, I took a course offered by Professor Frank Hoff, who uh, has passed away, but he was an expert on, uh, on the no theater. And uh, so I became fascinated <coughs> by Japanese theater as well. Uh, I was also fascinated by German culture. It had remained close to my heart. And of course, being an English major, I thought I should include something about English in there as well. And so a senior thesis was born uh, on the creative adaptation of the Japanese medieval no theater genre by three uh, 20th century European artists, the uh, Irish poet, William Butler Yeats, the German playwright, Bertolt Brecht, and the British composer, Benjamin Britten. And after about two and a half years of research, including one year at, uh, at Dartmouth College, where I, was, uh, I went as an exchange student. I finished and handed in a senior thesis. Uh, it was about 250 pages long. And I did not touch this topic at all during um, my years at Cornell University in the PhD program in comparative literature. Uh, although w at least one professor there told me the senior thesis I had written was, was good enough to be a dissertation, and I should you know, just forget all this nonsense about writing a new dissertation, just hand in my, my undergraduate senior thesis and be done with it. But I was uh, adamant about working on a new topic, and this is what I worked on. I apologize for this shameless advertising, but this is uh, the dissertation that became my first book. But in the years since uh, finishing my dissertation and uh, once I started teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, every few years I would have the opportunity of teaching a seminar on Japanese theater. And every time I would dip back into the material and I would try to update my research. And my thinking would also be further uh, pushed, pushed further really by my students, the interaction with the students in my seminar. In addition, I have been giving the students in my class the option of writing a no-style play as their final project, instead of writing an academic paper or taking an exam, they would have the option of writing a play. And about a dozen students over the years 
have come up with their own no style plays. And these contemporary no plays written in English by American undergraduate students have given me uh, even more of an appreciation of the creative potential of the genre. What fascinated me back in my undergraduate days uh, and fascinates me still is that the genre of no, which on the surface seems like such a, an esoteric and uh, austere, forbidding kind of a, of a form, should inspire so many different kinds of creative and transformative uh, efforts at adaptation. Yeats, uh, the, the Irish poet, wrote four plays for dancers, as he called them. Brecht wrote a number of Lehrstücke, uh, didactic plays, uh, in the late 1920s, uh, early 30s in Germany. And Britain wrote, uh, composed a number of operas, three operas, uh, which he called parables for church performance. They were operas designed to be performed in a church environment. So these very disparate, different genres were all inspired by Moore. And my hypothesis has been that the, the different artists were drawn to know for different reasons, and that the ways in which they came into contact with No uh, influenced what they took away from it. The quality of the translations, uh, whether they were able to actually see a performance, hear a performance, or only knew uh, No through textual means, etc. Uh, those affected the way in which these artists adapted the no theater. Yeats uh, depended on a translation by uh, Ernest Conolosa and uh, Ezra Pound, and we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. And he never saw no perform, although he uh, seems to have seen dances performed by a Japanese uh, dancer named Ito Michio. Bresch never saw no perform either. He relied on the translation German translation by uh, Elisabeth Hauptmann, which was in itself based on an English translation by Arthur Whaley. Britain, on the other hand, visited Japan in the 1950s and saw two performances of the no play, Sumidagawa. And he was also introduced to Japanese, other forms of Japanese music, the court music, Galaku in particular. So he had direct contact with no in performance. So part of the contrast between these artists is that while Yeats and Brecht only knew of the No Theatre through translations, through textual means, Britain saw and experienced No in performance. And moreover, the, the kinds of translations that, the, uh, that Yeats and Brecht relied on influenced, they were very idiosyncratic in their own way and influenced the way in which these artists experienced no. And in tracing these three lines of reception and transformation, adaptations, really fascinating comparisons and contrasts emerge. And uh, I've been struck in particular by three aspects uh, that become apparent in the process. The religious aspect is one of them. Uh, no, in its original context, has Shinto as well as Buddhist elements, but none of the European adapters uh, stuck with that original religious context. Yeats uh, poured the no uh, story into his own mystical belief system. Brecht, as a communist writer, attacked all forms of religion through his didactic plays. And Britain turned to Christianity for his framework, creating a ritualistic kind of opera to be performed in churches. Second, there is also the uh, political aspect. No, as a genre, had its origins in folk ritual, but eventually had come to be associated with the ruling class. Yeats similarly intended his dances for players, uh, uh, I'm sorry, plays for dances, uh, to be for the elite. Brecht, on the other hand, wrote his plays uh, to be performed by students for the sake of a communist pedagogy. And Britain wrote operas that were in line with his pacifist convictions that were his politics. 
And third and finally, the aspect of gender and sexuality no, is traditionally performed by an all-male cast, and at least in its early development, placed considerable emphasis on the appeal of the young male performer. And while the later process of refinement obscured this appeal considerably, uh, this is something that Britain, Benjamin Britten, as a gay composer, was probably attuned to uh, in a way that was not the case for Yeats and Brecht. For Yeats and Brecht, the all-male performance aspect of no seemed to have a uh, negligible impact. In fact, for both of them, the gender and sexual aspects of no as something that could be easily ignored for their own ideological concerns. So today I'd like to give you a, a quick overview of this topic, drawing on both old and new research, uh, going in chronological order, starting with a quick look at the earliest sort of interaction, the earliest phase of your American reception of no, then presenting the adaptations of Yeats, Brecht, and Britain, and ending with the no-inspired works undertaken by my students. But first, a little background information on the No Theatre, with apologies to those of you for whom this is, this is common knowledge. Uh, but No is fundamentally a theatre of anti-realism. It is a theatre of mimesis. It is not a theatre of mimesis and description, but rather of symbolism and formalization. And this can be seen in all aspects of the text and performance. The physical construction of the stage differs greatly from the Western counterpoint. Uh, the stage is a square platform, and there is a uh, bridgeway that connects the main part of the stage with the backstage area, the mirror room, actors and musicians enter and exit along this bridge to the, uh, the square main acting area. And the acting, uh, the main stage is covered by a roof which imitates the form of a shrine. A painted pine tree decorates the back panel, as you can see there. And uh, bamboos are painted on either side, uh, on the side door on the right, from which the chorus enters. And except for a few simple props, no scenery is used and no attempt is really made to present a realistic picture of the scene. And uh, I guess this must be the, the feature uh, of the, uh, the drum. The musical accompaniment is played by an ensemble of flute, the shoulder drum, the, uh, the side drum or hip drum, and the stick drum. The musicians sit at the back of the stage and coordinate the accompaniment, the musical accompaniment which really ignores the fixed pitch or measured rhythm or harmony in the Western sense. The chorus sits to the right side of the stage, consists usually of eight to 10 members, and serves to mediate between the events on stage and the audience while maintaining a sense of distance between the theater and the realistic world. The main actor wears a mask for portraying various characters, uh, masks for uh, gods, for, uh, for women, uh, for a warrior, and for a female demon. All roles are played, however, by male actors. And the male actors wear highly elaborate costumes. Its function, again, is not a realistic presentation of character but the exhibition of beautiful colors and materials. The miming and dancing are both extremely slow and stylized. A step can mean a complete journey. The lifting of one hand can suggest weeping, and the lifting of both hands, as you see here, is really the height of great, great sadness, great passion. So these conventions of no distance the performance from the real world and thus make the symbolic presentation of the dramatic text possible. The no text uh, itself is highly anti-realistic. The plot is taken <coughs> from a variety of Japanese and foreign stories, mythical or legendary. 
or inspired by Japanese and Chinese classical poems. And the text is often described as a brocade consisting of diverse pieces of old and beautiful scraps because the frequency of citation and allusion to classical poems and stories. And many of the plays follow a, a definite pattern. In the first part, a traveler arrives at a place, then a local, a place of some historical significance. A local person appears, explains the legend associated with the place, uh, engages in some question and answer with the priest, and eventually reveals her, his or her true identity uh, and before disappearing. And this intermission enables the main actor, the shte, to change costumes. Meanwhile, another local person, uh, played by a Kyogen comic actor, comes along, clarifies and, and supplements the story in greater detail, and suggests that the person who has just disappeared was probably the ghost uh, of, of the famous person uh, in disguise and exists. The traveler uh, is waiting or he falls asleep. The ghost reappears, which then reappears this time in the form it had in life and tells us of its past experiences uh, through song and dance. Finally, as the day dawns, the ghost disappears and all is discovered to have taken place in the traveler's dream. This is the typical style of a role play. This unusual structure uh, allows the playwright an extraordinary degree of freedom. The story can take place anywhere, anytime. And it's easy to perceive how these anti-realistic elements uh, would have appealed to Western artists trying to transcend the limitations of the theater of realism. So a quick history of the reception, uh, the 14th to 15th century uh, is really the height uh, of Minot's uh, refinement. And the first Europeans to see a performance of Minot were probably missionaries in the 16th century, sent from Spain or Portugal. And some of the letters of these missionaries record that the Japanese were a theater-loving folk and the biblical no plays were uh, created for the purpose of spreading Christianity. Such uh, Christian no plays no longer exist uh, as texts today, but it is thought that they dealt with uh, plots such as Adam and Eve, Noah and the Flood, uh, the birth of Jesus, and so on and so forth. During the years of isolation uh, from the 17th and 19th centuries, uh, of course, the West had little direct contact with Japan, and it was during this time that no theater itself also changed in quality. Uh, it was protected and controlled by the shogun's government, the shogun as part of official ceremonies, and it became increasingly esoteric and removed uh, from the tastes of the general populace, probably became much more slow uh, in performance as well. But with the fall of the shogunate in 1868 and the abolishing of the uh, samurai rank, the, the end of no, the demise of no is imminent. Yet certain individuals uh, worked hard to keep no alive. Umewaka Minoru, who was a no master, uh, stayed in the capital uh, to maintain the traditional theater. Uh, Iwakura Tomomi, uh, who observed operas uh, on his foreign missions to Europe and the United States, opera being performed for aristocrats and dignitaries, decided that no should become the equivalent of that in Japan, and it should become a national and imperial form of entertainment. The first Westerner on record to have seen no performance uh, after uh, the Meiji Restoration was Prince Alfred, the second son of Queen Victoria, who saw a performance in 1869. And uh, other dignitaries followed, Prince Alexis of Russia, the Prince of Italy, etc., all attended no performances in the years to follow. Ulysses Grant, the, uh, the former president of the United States, was highly impressed by a no performance he saw in 1879. And he was the one who urged Iwakura Kumomi to preserve this tradition. And this kind of early foreign interest in the no theater may indeed have been one of the reasons, one of the factors that ensured Noh's survival in the Meiji era, since this was definitely uh, a time of rapid modernization and westernization. 
a trio of men forged links between law and English theater in the early 20th century, and we will now turn to them. Ernest Fanalosa uh, is famous for his enthusiasm for classical Japanese art, but he also devoted himself to the study of Mo. He was invited to Japan as a professor of economics and philosophy at Tokyo Imperial University and was later appointed commissioner of art research by the Japanese government. From 1898, he started taking no lessons from Umewata Minoru and translated a number of plays. Uh, but he died before he was able to put his work together in a publishable form. So his widow entrusted the manuscripts to Ezra Pound, who uh, was a poet, uh, then becoming, uh, beginning to attract attention as the leader of the Imagist poetry movement. Ezra Pound didn't know Japanese. He had never been to Japan. So it was perhaps inevitable that his version of no, his reception of no uh, and presentation of no would be rather strange, inaccurate, etc. But it was precisely this lack of detailed knowledge that enabled Pound to create a free kind of translation of considerable poetic beauty. Pound emphasized the noble and aristocratic nature of no, and on the other hand, he de-emphasized the populist and Buddhist context of Mo. And it seems that Pound never knew that Fenelosa was actually uh, ordained as a Buddhist priest. This was something that uh, Fenelosa's widow kept secret, kept uh, away from Pound's knowledge. So uh, in Pound's transmission of Fenelosa's manuscript, Buddhism becomes de-emphasized. And it's a fairly recent scholarship by the Ezra Pound Society of Japan which has elucidated the extent to which Pound's own rather uh, idiosyncratic belief system influenced uh, his translation process. For William Butler Yeats, when he was introduced by Pound uh, to the no genre, what mattered most was no's characteristics as anti-realist theater, the use of the mask, and the emphasis on dance, uh, as well as the emphasis played on no as a gentrified and noble art, allowed Yeats to make use of this genre in creating his own place for dancers. Yeats himself had been frustrated in his attempt to create a nationalist kind of theater for the Irish independence movement. And he had come to the conclusion that realistic theater was, was not useful, it was theater for the masses, and what he needed was a theater for the elite, for educated people with the background, inclination, and leisurely mindset for appreciating his complex art. And the famous quote from um, his place in controversies says, I wanted to create for myself an unpopular theater and an audience like a secret society where admission is by favor and never to many. So it's possible to see how Yeats's contact with No uh, was something that was enabled by Penelosa and Pound's translation. And in the end, it resulted in justifying Yeats's own uh, elitism. Some would even say proto-fascism. In later years, <coughs> Yeats would uh, express his admiration for, for fascist politics. And he wrote uh, four plays for dancers. These illustrations are from a play called At the Hawk's Well, which draws on the no play Yoro. But in my theater seminar and in the long version of this paper, I do a close analysis of another uh, play, uh, The Dreaming of the Bones, uh, for, that is based on the no play Nishigi. There are many fascinating points of contrast, uh, including the happy ending of Nishigi and the tragic ending of The Dreaming of the Bones. Uh, to cite just one example from the very ending, uh, I'm not going to sort of go into the details. Fenelosa's translation of the, uh, the ending of the no play is 
so rather literal. Uh, and but in the uh, pound translation, I've underlined the words of negation. Uh, we ask you do not awake, we all will wither away. The ones in this cloth of a dream, now you will come out of sleep, you tread the border and nothing awaits you. You know, all of this will wither away. There is nothing here but this cave in the field's midst. Today's wind moves in the pines, a wild place, unlit and unfilled. And those of you who have the hands out, the hand out, you can sort of compare this with the previous pages, Japanese. Uh, it, it really is Pound who is adding all of these words of negation. And it seems to me that this has made an impact, along with Yeats's own tragic view of Irish history uh, in the tragic ending that he created for his play. In Yeats's play, a young Irish patriot refuses to forgive the ghost of a legendary couple whose adultery had caused the invasion of Ireland by the English back in the 12th century. Now, in the no play, the typical no play, the priest uh, prays for the, the soul, uh, prays for the, uh, the release of the ghost, um, and that is the case with Nishkidi as well. But in Yeats's vision, there is no forgiveness, there is no salvation, and there is no happy ending. So it was through the mediation of Penaloso and Pound that Yeats came into contact with No and adapted it for his own political and artistic purposes. Next, we turn to uh, Bertolt Brecht, the German playwright. His you no know, adaptations were driven by his own political and aesthetic concerns, which happened to be the polar opposite of those of Yeats. His encounter uh, with No came uh, in the years after World War I in, in Weimar, Germany. And Brecht had achieved success uh, in notoriety for satiric works that attacked the bourgeoisie. But having converted to communism, uh, Brecht's creative activities in the late 20s uh, and 30s centered around a new form of theater, the Lehrstücke, or didactic plays, which aimed to educate both the performer and spectator in order to promote social change along communist lines. Earlier, he had uh, proposed a new form of theater called the Epic Theater, uh, and she contrasted that with the traditional theater traditional Western theater which seeks to create an illusion uh, and entices the audience to suspend the disbelief and allows the audience to uh, escape from, from depressing uh, daily life. Epic theater was a very different form of theater which uh, promoted awareness of social reality by presenting disconcerting or alienating stage pictures. But he needed, Fresh needed a form of theater that was even more simplified and stylized than the epic theater because he wanted his, uh, his Lehrstücke to be performed by students. So it had to be a really streamlined form of uh, performance. And this is how he encountered law. Whatever uh, Brecht never saw nor performed, and whatever he learned of the genre came through his assistant, Elizabeth Hauptmann, who was bilingual in English and German. And it has become increasingly clear through a scholarship that Hauptmann was much more than just an assistant to Brecht and was an important collaborator in the Brecht Collective. But the significance of her role is something that is really just only beginning to be understood along with the, uh, the frankly sexist nature of Brecht's association and exploitation of the women around him. Hauptmann based her own English, I mean German translation on Arthur Rayleigh's English translation. Uh, Arthur Rayleigh is a, a well-known figure uh, among Japan scholars in, uh, in the English-speaking uh, world. He never set foot in Japan, but uh, unlike Pound, really knew classical Japanese and he wanted to create a translation that would make no accessible, not mystifying, to uh, the general reader of English. And this intention of treating no as accessible literature uh, is 
reflected, for example, in his translation uh, of the no play Panico, which was used by Brecht eventually. And uh, again, I've given just the beginning in this case of the, uh, the no play Panico. And as you can see in Rayleigh's translation, uh, he uses generic terms instead of technical terms that suggest religious or, or ritual aspects of, of the original. I am a teacher, I keep a school at one point, uh, into the mountains, etc. The story of Panico concerns a boy who goes on a pilgrimage uh, to pray for his mother's recovery from illness. The boy becomes sick during this journey in the mountains, and according to the religious rules, he must be thrown down into the valley, uh, the Taniko uh, of the title, because his sickness signifies ritual contamination, spiritual contamination, and this valley uh, ritual is performed by the pilgrims with reluctance. And in the second half of the play, uh, the tragic tone is reversed. There is a happy ending in which the mountain god answers the pilgrim's prayers by restoring the boy to life. But in translating this play, Whaley performs the role of a cultural mediator, uh, and uh, so he replaces the technical religious terms with generic terms. Uh, and another uh, major thing that he does is to uh, choose not to translate the second half. He just has a footnote to explain you know, in the second half of this play, uh, there's a, this, this miracle that happens, but he decides not to translate it. As a result of the removal of this happy ending, which is supposed to prove the miraculous power of religion, the focus of the entire play is shifted to the darker aspects of religious sacrifice. So the way Rayleigh presents it, uh, the story of Taniko really is, becomes a story of the irrationality, the cruelty of religion. And it is this version of No that was received uh, by Brecht. The fact that No in Japan was uh, traditionally performed by generations of disciplined professionals uh, didn't really make an impact on Brecht. Uh, he wanted to use the No theater as a form of performance by students. Yeats wrote a play called The Yazage, He Who Says Yes, uh, and this was composed, uh, put while, uh, composed the music for it and became an opera. And in this version, uh, as you can see, the simplified language is retained. I am the teacher, I teach school in the city, I said I have a student. Um, but Brecht also added another twist. Uh, I'm taking a trip over the mountains. An epidemic has broken out among us, and in the city beyond the mountains live some famous doctors. So this becomes now, instead of a ritual pilgrimage, becomes a trip uh, to, to find medicine for, um, for sickness. And by removing the religious justification for uh, the boy's travel and then his ritual uh, hurling into the valley, Brecht accentuates the controversial notion of, of uh, Einverständnis. This is a term that has been translated as understanding or agreement uh, or acceptance, and it had become a central concept for Brecht's didactic plays. And the idea is that under certain circumstances in the revolutionary struggle, an individual must be sacrificed for the sake of the group, but uh, a precondition for that is that the individual fully understands and accepts the reason why it's being, he is being sacrificed. And so the chorus at the beginning of the play, the Yazaga, uh, this is my translation from the German, um, talks about the importance of, of this Einverständnis, of understanding. Again, in the uh, longer version of this manuscript, I trace a complicated process, a dialectical process, by which Brecht further refined the adaptation of uh, Taniko. Eventually, he came up with a double play, the Ya Zaga, he who says yes, and the Nein Zaga, he who says no. 
because he considered uh, the situation in the Yazaga to be uh, a little problematic. So in the Nine Zaga, he says no, there is, there is really no reason for the individual to be sacrificed for the community. And as you can see here, I've just underlined uh, some of the more striking passages. I want to turn back immediately. In light of this new situation, now the boy is arguing, I am sick, but now I want to turn back. And as for the ancient and mighty custom, it seems utterly unreasonable to me. What I need is a new custom, which must be immediately put into practice, namely the custom to think anew for each situation. So the boy refuses to be thrown into the valley. And as you can see, we have come very far from the no theater indeed. I wanted to show, uh, this is sort of part of the dialectical development. Uh, eventually, Brecht wrote an, uh, an opera, uh, the lyrics of an opera called Die Masna, the measures taken. And although this is not uh, directly based on a no play, it gives you some sense of the kind of aesthetic that uh, Brechtian theater is associated with. <laughs> German. But you can see uh, the stage was uh, fairly bare and uh, the actors came through the audience in a way that made the audience wonder what is going on, breaking the sense of illusion. Uh, and later on, uh, if I had time, I could show you uh, the sections where they, uh, the actors sort of collectively think about the pro problems presented to them, and then they end up with the answer nine or no uh, in this case. Finally, I'd like to uh, turn to Benjamin Britten, who uh, visited Japan uh, in 1956. And initially, he, was, he had some very interesting and strange ideas about Japan. This is from a letter uh, that he wrote to uh, a friend. He said, it is, by far the, it is far the strangest country we have been, yet been to. Like, in a way, going to a country which is inhabited by a very intelligent kind of insect. Very industrious, very clever, but very different from us, very odd. So this impression of, of strangeness uh, that struck him eventually was replaced uh, by a, a sort of fascination and admiration, I think, he attended uh, two performances of No, and he was deeply moved by the experience. Uh, he wrote, quote, the whole occasion made a tremendous impression upon me, the simple touching story, the economy of the style, the intense slowness of the action, the marvelous skill and control of the performers, the beautiful costumes, the mixing of chanting, speech, singing, which with the three instruments made up the strange music, it all offered a totally new operatic experience." Uh, Britain was so impressed by the simple intensity of these new performances that he eventually created an opera based on the play called Curlew River, with the subtitle, A Parable for Church Performance. It was first performed in, in 1964, and the dramatic action was transpo uh, transported from medieval Japan to uh, East Anglia in England in the Middle Ages. And many important stylistic features of the original were retained, including an all-male cast, uh, even the use of a mask, a modified mask. 
small instrumental ensemble without conductor. And uh, the main characters were performed on a simple stage, faithfully reproducing the economy of style of the original. Some other details that have to be changed. The, uh, the Miyakodori and the original no play of Sumidagawa have to be changed into the curlew, which is a, a river bird. Uh, and here is uh, on the right side a drawing by uh, Colin Graham, who was the director of the first performance. And as you can see, he, he constructed a wooden stage, a round wooden stage, uh, with space for the musicians to the side, and the central part raised a little bit to simulate um, the main part of the stage and then a bridgeway leading to the main part as well. The most intriguing aspect of this process of adaptation was the uh, transporting of the story from a Buddhist context to a Christian one. In the original no play, the tragedy uh, is a tragedy of a mother who has lost her son and strongly reflected the Buddhist belief in the transitory nature of the world. It has one of the, uh, really, the saddest endings of any no play um, that, that I have seen in performance and uh, in the performance that I saw, I could, I could hear the the audience members sniffling uh, around me, they were, they were actually sort of very much touched by the sadness of the ending. But in creating an operatic adaptation, this religious element was transformed to suit the framework of a uh, miracle play, Christian miracle play, and the result became a work celebrating the power of uh, Christian belief. When I was an undergraduate, I spent the bulk of my senior thesis on Britain's adaptation of No into opera, because it seemed to me the most complete form of adaptation uh, based on direct experience of No in its proper context. A couple of elements uh, I don't have much time to go into, uh, but he used uh, a, a chant as the basis for the whole opera, and in the beginning, each of the members uh, in the cast come chanting, and then they are sort of ritually uh, transformed into uh, their roles. I want to show you a little bit of the, the video of Sumidagawa. It's just an excerpt of the last part, where the mother uh, thinks she sees the ghost of the son, but the, the, the son sort of disappears. And then I will also uh, show you a little bit of the ending of Curlew River. Oh, no, 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 no,
language there, the, uh, the ending is a reverse of the beginning where each of the uh, main actors, uh, the performers, this robe, and then they walk off uh, chanting the same chant as they did at the beginning. If I could stop the lights, thank you. When uh, Britain When Britain visited Japan and wrote this opera, it was still rare for someone living outside Japan to have seen No performed. No was first performed abroad for the first time in 1954 at the International Drama Festival in Venice and has toured abroad a number of times since then, but it still remains less accessible than the other major form of classical Japanese theater, the kabuki. And my hypothesis back as an undergraduate was that because Britain saw, saw no in performance and was struck by its powerfully ritualistic nature, he worked to find an equivalent in its own cultural context and thus came to use the Christian miracle play as his framework. What puzzled me was what seemed like a contradiction between this overarching framework of the Christian church and Britain's own identity as a gay man. In the years since then, since the time I wrote my senior thesis, the development of both feminist criticism and queer musicology has made it possible to push my own thinking on this topic a little further. Uh, in, my, in particular, it has become possible, I think, uh, for me to understand some of the complex mot motivations behind Britain's exploration of Eastern music, including Japanese no and gagaku, but also the Indonesian gamelan. The musicologist Philip Brett has argued that the sonorities of Eastern music, a kind of Orientalist musical motif in, British, uh, in Britain's compositions, correspond to a kind of longing for exotic and forbidden sexuality. It is further possible to speculate, perhaps, how significant it was for Britain to find and know a formalized theater in which it is acceptable for a adult male in the role of a grieving mother to express sadness over the loss of a young boy. That is to say, the aesthetic of no that has been obscured by centuries of refinement, the aesthetic of homoerotic attractiveness of the young male performer is here brought close to the surface, but perhaps not fully to the surface. Uh, one of the strange things about Britain and the scholarship, the musicological scholarship about him until the late 1980s, really, was that his sexual status remained an open secret, it seemed. It took me until the very end of my research process as an undergraduate to finally uh, figure out definitely that Britain was gay and that the singer Peter Pierce, who premiered the role of the mad woman in Pearly River, was indeed Britain's life companion. I'm still not sure how to fully integrate this aspect into the analysis of Britain's no adaptation, the significance he placed on the ritualistic framework and the transposing of the story into a Christian context. But it does seem to me that Britain, both as a gay man in a homophobic British society of the 1950s and 60s, and as a traveler in Japan, that is, as a stranger journeying through a landscape that was, was at once intriguing and forbidding, found in no a structure through which it was possible to articulate complex emotions of loss, longing, and salvation. And finally, for the students taking my seminar on Japanese theater uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, the inspiration for writing a no-play come primarily from reading plays in translation, no-plays in translation, and from analyzing and discussing these earlier examples of adaptation. They will have seen DVDs and videos of excerpts of various plays, and will have seen images of masks and costumes, but will not have experienced no in actual performance. The inspiration then for them is mostly textual. But some striking examples have emerged. Uh, a play that remains very uh, memorable to me is based on the life of the poet Sylvia Plath. Uh, one student wrote a play about her life, and then uh, the following year, 
uh, another group of students staged the play uh, at Penn. There were no plays on the, uh, the diary of Anne Frank, no plays based on the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. This arisen from ashes, uh, no play on that, uh, including some New York City firefighter uh, ghosts. A play on the right uh, is on Admiral, uh, Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku and uh, Admiral Nimitz as well. Shakespeare remains a popular source for no adaptation. Uh, there's one on Hamlet on the left and the other one based on Much Ado About Nothing. But this semester, for the first time, I have taught this seminar in Japan, here in Kyoto, where students had multiple opportunities to see live performances of No. Moreover, two of the performances that most students saw uh, took place in settings other than a theater. One took place at the uh, Shiramine Jinja, and the another, other one at the uh, Daikakuji Temple. In addition, two students took up No chanting as a weekly practice, and half a dozen students had the unusual experience of being allowed to wear uh, these very expensive no costumes uh, and putting on masks on the, uh, in a hands-on session at the Kawamura no Gakudo. So the question, of course, is whether this group of students who have just finished the course last Friday, uh, I'm sorry, last Thursday, would come up with adaptations of no plays that are substantially different from those produced by students in previous years who did not have the same kind of direct exposure. It is a little early to tell since the final drafts were handed in yesterday and I have not had the chance to read them carefully, but a quick look suggests a couple of contrasts. One, a higher percentage of students uh, chose to write no place this year than in previous years, a total of five students out of 13, and two more students uh, did their final projects uh, related to no as well. And two, a higher percentage took approaches that led them to twist the no aesthetic in a fundamental way, such as parodies and uh, pastiches. And this latter point may seem a little surprising, given that students had the chance to see no in performance. Would it not make sense for them to take no more seriously? But I believe, in fact, the opposite has happened. These students at KCJS were able to see not only No, but also Kyogen, Bundaku, Kabuki, and Takarazuka in live performance. And many of them noted and were appreciative of the humor present in these other genres, particularly Kyogen, Kabuki, and Takarazuka. It may well be the case that, in contrast, the seriousness of No stood out but was also relativized as something that can be taken up and transformed and transposed. At least that is the explanation that makes the most sense to me. The range of chosen topics this year was as wide ranging as in the past years, a no version of Shakespeare's Macbeth, of Kafka's novel, The Trial, of the story of Hector from the Iliad, a parody of Oedipus, and a parody of Saigyo Zakura in Mokwe that quotes liberally from manga and anime. Each of these students, both those in Philadelphia and Kyoto, have taken their own creative journeys inspired by No, just like William Butler Yeats, Bertolt Brecht, and Benjamin Britten before them. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>